Finally, after just about a, almost a year of not teaching any astrology courses, I'm really happy to be back here teaching what I think is going to be the most important course I've ever taught. It's on Lajitadi Vashtas. I'm calling this course Lajitadi Vashtas Master's Course. And it's not because we're going to learn everything there is to learn about Lajitadi Vashtas. It's because we're going to apply the Lajitadi Vashtas in a way that you have mastery over your life. And to me, what I mean by that is that you actually start living a life that's working for you. Where you get to feel good about yourself, feel good about the things in your life, and feel good in general. Okay? We all got driven to astrology uh, through pain. I don't know anyone that you know, didn't sink into astrology because everything in their life was working out so wonderful and they had to figure out why the gods were so nice to them. You know, we got here because of what wasn't working. And I really spent, what is it now, 27, 28, 28, almost 29 years um, focusing on astrology, trying to figure out how we can use these horoscopes to be happier ultimately. Okay? How can we use astrology to have a better existence? And I've done lots of things. I've had lots of success with lots of people with lots of different ways. But I think what I'm teaching in this course is by far the most valuable thing I've encountered in the occult world when it comes to helping us um, with what we really need. You know, astrology is so vast, we can just talk about things forever. But at the end of the day, what we all want is we want to feel better. And there's a reason we're not feeling better. Okay? And the Lajitani of Ashta is the way I'm going to show them in this course, the way I'm going to teach them in this course, is going to help you see why you're not feeling good. Okay? Now, on a very basic level, not even involved with the Lajitani of Ashtas, we're not feeling good because we're sick. We, we're in a state of disease. Okay? There's a lack of ease. We're not feeling good. Okay? And we have a sickness on the mental level, which means we have all these ideas that are incorrect about ourselves. We walk around with incorrect ideas about ourselves and therefore life. Because we walk around with incorrect ideas, we're focusing our energy on incorrect things. As a result of that, we're feeling bad about things. As a result of feeling bad with things, our body takes the brunt of that and our body starts to fail us and give us problems as well. Okay? So this disease process starts in the mind and the final symptoms are in the body. But it's a whole process of living in a way that's not right for you because of the wrong ideas that we have, you know, attached ourselves to. And we're really down here on earth to resolve those things, to have true ideas about ourselves, and therefore to live truthfully in accordance with ourselves. at which point our disease is going to leave us. Our mental, emotional, physical, all of our diseases will be things we let go of instead of things that we collect. Every year, it's like, oh, it's New Year's. Well, I'm going to add two more diseases, right? Seems that way sometimes. No, we want every year to check off, okay, I'm free from that disease. I feel better there. Now, when it comes to healing, what any physician has known for a very, very long time is that if you're sick, you have to get away from the thing that's making you sick. So if you live on cocoa puffs, and you go to the doctor, and the doctor says, let me give you these antibiotics, and he gives you antibiotics, you're not going to really get better. You'll feel a little better for a little while, but you're not any better because you're still eating cocoa puffs. Okay? You have to get off the cocoa puffs first. You stop eating the cocoa puffs, you probably won't even need the antibiotics. So you have to remove yourself from what's making you sick. Now, in the old days when people's fate in the yuga, the age of the older days, you know, really of before the 1800s, but it's really accelerated in the last century. People were sick because of real physical reasons. Lack of sanitation, lack of any available, enough available food, just simply enough food even for a large part of the population. Um, living in unsanitary conditions, living in houses where they burnt wood smoke uh, six months of the year and were inhaling wood smoke six months of the year so that the most common source of death was lung failure, lung congestion. So, 
these people with their physical problems, they weren't going to get away, get healthy until they removed themselves from the things that were destroying them on a physical level. In this age that we've moved into, you know, the psychological age that we're in now, the problem with healing is that we're, it's our it's psychological environment that we have to get improve. Okay? It's not the external environment. It's literally our psychological environment that we have to remove ourselves from. Which means there's six things in our psychological environment that until we remove them, we're just not going to get better. So people run from healer to healer to doctor to doctor and don't get better, even with their physical diseases these days. The reason is because it's, a re it's the result of the psychological diseases, the mental and emotional diseases. And until that inner environment is the poison, the toxin in that inner environment is removed, you're not going to get better on a mental, emotional, or physical level. A lot of you know I've spent the last four years really focused on homeopathy, okay? Um, working with astro-homeopathy, developing a way to use homeopathy from the horoscope. And while I was working with these remedies, um, and what I, the reason I focus on homeopathy, because homeopathy doesn't just affect a person on the physical level, it affects a person on a mental level. So yes, I've given people remedies who are suicidal, they take one little pill and they're not feeling suicidal anymore. Wow, you know, with a, a physical remedy going all the way to the mental level. Um, and the emotional levels, and of course the physical. So, it's really exciting when that happens. But what I found over the years and years of, of working with the homeopathy, you know, that really was my focus. I haven't had any availability for other readings the last four years because I've been processing and working with a lot of homeopathic cases. What I noticed first on myself was that I took a lot of remedies that were like, whoa, Wow, what a shift. I take that remedy and I was like, wow, I noticed a huge healing. Okay, I was very happy with the results of the, of the remedy. But then there was a time, and what I noticed with, I always had an insight coming to me before I took the remedies that really changed me. So there was an awareness going on in my consciousness about myself, about my psychology, about my behavior that I became aware of. And that made me go, aha, I'll take this remedy. I took the remedy, boom. But one time, I got this awareness, and I said, okay, cool, I'm not going to take the remedy. I got the awareness of what my issue was, why my left shoulder had been hurting for six months, because of an, 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 you know, an experience with a friend, a you know, five-minute thing with a friend. It made me realize, aha, that's why my shoulder's hurting. So, aha, that's the remedy I need for this. I saw it as a symbol of that remedy. But instead of taking the remedy, I said, okay, I'm just going to work this through in my mind. I'm just going to work this internally. I'm going to take the remedy that I think I need. And I healed my shoulder. My shoulder stopped bothering me, that right shoulder, which had been really plaguing me for a long, long time. So I, re I changed something in my inner environment, and I didn't even need the remedy. Okay? And then I found the time where I just got was getting sicker and sicker and sicker. And every month I was taking a new remedy and every month I was getting sicker and sicker and sicker. And the remedies weren't working. But during the whole time I wasn't having an internal shift. Okay? So it wasn't working, you know? And then I have the people who I'm not able to help with the homeopathy. Why? It's because if we don't remove ourselves from the disease-causing environment, no remedy is going to really be able to make up for that. You know, so on a physical level, if you're eating cocoa puffs and you get sick from that, nothing is going to really make you healthy until you stop eating cocoa puffs. Then if you take the right remedy, wow, you're going to heal a lot faster. But even if you don't take the remedy, if you stop eating cocoa puffs, you're going to start progressing at a good pace. Okay? And these days, our diseases are psychologically centered. Which, all, which means mentally, emotionally centered. So we have to shift that inner environment. Okay? If we don't, we can't be, have any confidence in any remedy. Okay? So it's those type of experiences that led me to focus on the Lajitadi Abhashta, is my favorite thing in, in astrology, in the world of astrology, to help you all 
and help myself, well, help myself first, right? Because like I said, the last 20 remedies didn't work for me. Although it really wasn't that many, it was several. You know, I just couldn't crack it with the homeopathy. So, we have to change the environment. So what we're here to do is to change your environment of why your life's not working for you, why you're not happy. And we want to have a healthy life. We're here to have a healthy life. We're here to get healthy, okay? I see world, this earth is like a sanitarium, you know? God says, oh, yeah, throw him in that earth clinic. <sighs> Tosses us down there, you know? And the angels are going, well, okay, is he gonna have a good doctor down there? It's like, it doesn't hardly matter. He's got all the patients around him to help him with his problems. And so we're in this big, you know, in this, on this globe of, you know, sick people bumping against each other and through that polishing each other and learning our lessons and growing healthy very, very, very slowly, slower than we want to. And so one of the goals of this course is to speed that up. I hope everyone that takes this course cries a lot and finds your life different when we get to the parts of the course that apply to your horoscope, okay? All right, so we wanna have a healthy life, which means we wanna have freedom from mental, energetic, physical, or emotional and physical disease, okay? When we have, I'm gonna read some off the manual here that will be included, okay? So freedom from mental diseases gives us wisdom, the truth of where you fit into life and knowing you, okay, knowing who you are and what you truly are. That's critical to having the right people in your life, the right profession in the life, your life, the right everything in your life. If you start your day with wrong conceptions about who you are, of course you're going to end up with wrong things in your life. You know? So we want to have the freedom to be free from all these wrong ideas that are the number one reason we're sabotaging our life, okay? All right, freedom from, let's see, freedom from energetic diseases allows you to react and respond to life in a way that is correct for you. That's really heavy, that's really deep. Your energy, your life force, your prana, whatever you want to call it, is designed to respond to life in a way that allows your life to work. But, if you have energetic disease, which is the result of you having wrong ideas about yourself, you're not going to allow yourself to follow the promptings of your inner energy. So your energy will say, yes, this is what I need to do. And your wrong ideas about yourself will say, oh, I could never do that. That's evil. I can't do that. No, my mom would get mad at me. Whatever. God doesn't want me to. Whatever. And you don't do it. Now your energy is out of balance. It's not flowing the way it needs to with the world. It's not flowing the way it needs to in yourself. And then you start getting depressed, despondent, angry, frustrated, unhappy, and you get emotional disease. So you get all these feelings. You get huge needs. You get huge passions for things. You go to extremes on an emotional level. Where what you want is you want freedom from all that chaos, freedom from all that emotional disease. You want peace. Okay? Peace is where we're at when we're going to respond the right way for ourselves, the right way for the per other people in the room, when necessary, when it's time to respond, when it's time to act. Okay? When we pray in Hinduism, we always say Om Shanti. We say peace. You know? Wow, why do we say peace? Because it's that important. Okay? All right. Freedom from... Um, okay. Freedom from emotional disease gives peace, which not only has its own rewards, but which is also crucial to successful human relationships. If you're lacking peace and instead you're having frustration, anger, bitterness, and depression, you're not going to have successful human relationships or longings. You're just not going to. Okay? Then freedom from physical diseases allows you to use your body to do the things that are important to you. And this is a key word, to do the things that are important to you. Okay? There's that one physicist, we all know who he is, he's in a wheelchair. Does he have physical disease of being in a wheelchair? No. Because he did what was important to him. Okay? Physical problems with your body are only a disease if it prevents you from doing what's important to you. Because then the question is, why is your body manifesting something that keeps you from doing something important to you? 
because it's a disease. There's a mental pathology behind that, okay? That needs to be cured and healed. All right. So we want to be freedom from these diseases, okay? So some questions. Do you feel like your life is right for you? You know, do you wake up and say, this is the right life for me again today? You know, you do that every day. Are the people in your life working with who you are? Do you wake up and say, well, the shoe of the people in my life fit my feet perfectly. Everything's so comfy and workable, you know? Sure, sometimes my shoes are a little cold and I stick my feet in, but they warm up. Sometimes my shoes are a little tight from having been wet the day before, but I put my, foot, my, foot, my feet in and they wiggle around and they fit me. Are the people in your life like that or not? Okay. Are you taking, this is a big one, are you taking joy in being yourself? Does being yourself actually feel good to you? Okay. Not only when you're alone, hidden away in a cave, but when you're actually around other people. Okay. If not, learning about your Lajitani Vashas will help you to do these things. Okay. Other questions. Are you frustrated, angry, bitter, disconnected? Okay. If yes, then learning about your Lajitani Vashas will help you replace these feelings with feelings that are worth waking up to and worth going to sleep to. You know, wouldn't it be nice if every day you, the way you felt when you woke up was something worth waking up to? And every day as you went to sleep, the feelings you had were worth falling asleep to. You know? It should really be the goal of life. Now many great teachers, including Paramahansa Yogananda, but we've all heard this, have said that we are the products of our habits. You're the product of your habit. What I love about these teachers, they say these profound things, and they expect us to have a brain. It only took me 30-some years to figure out what products of our habits really can mean. Okay? They really expect us to do the work, okay? But that doesn't mean we're going to try to shortcut it with the Lajitadi Avashtas. That's our goal, <laughs> okay? So we're a product of our habits. The reason I never thought about that deeply enough when I heard that is because it sounds so simple. It's a, this statement has very simple and very profound meanings, okay? In the context of the Lajitadi Avashtas, it's extremely profound, okay? Now, how we normally hear about it is a very simple way. So, for instance, if a person is in the habit of exercising and eating well, they will have the product of a healthier body, along with all the advantages that a healthy body can provide. Duh, right? Okay? Similarly, if a person is in the habit of meditating, they will have the products of greater peace and spiritual experiences. Right? Duh, okay? If, on the other hand, a person smokes and eats prepackaged foods, they will have the product of an unhealthy body along with the liabilities that come with that. That again, right? This is simple to understand. Okay, so I don't want to think about it anymore. That's what I think a lot of us hear when we hear this idea that we're the product of our habits. It's like that, okay? But let's really think about it. This is not what I mean in this course at all, okay? It's not about the habits of things like meditating, running, and what you're sticking in your mouth. Okay, it's much more deeper than that. When I say good or bad habits, I mean, are you in the habit of following the divine intelligence within you that will guide you, choice by choice, to a healthier life experience? Or are you in the habit of following something else, anything else, other than that, which is always going to sidetrack you, derail you, and makes it impossible for you to live a healthy life? So that's just one good habit in this world to me, and that's following the divine intelligence within yourself. Following anything else is a bad habit. So, if my divine intelligence says not to meditate, meditating becomes a bad habit. Okay? We're not all supposed to meditate. Jamini tells us all the different ways we can find God. Every planet has a way of helping you find God. Only two of them are Raj Yoga Meditation. You know, so if you tell everyone they need to do Raj Yoga meditation to find God, you're lying to them. Okay? Only two out of nine people need to do Raj Yoga meditation to find God. Okay? Alright, so, we don't need to tell anyone anything who's following their inner guidance, their divine intelligence within them, but they're in the good habit of doing that. Okay? And we can't tell anyone precisely what's right for them to the same degree of accuracy as that divine intelligence can. No matter 
how good an astrologer we are. There's always a margin of error every time you try to tell someone what they should do based on their horoscope. Okay? All right. So there's just two habits, good and bad. Let's say that my, I wake up one day and my divine energy says, go eat Cocoa Puffs. Okay? And I go, huh, that's strange. So I, you know, I, I tell my kids who are on the way over, hey, grab some Cocoa Puffs and some really cheap vitamin D milk. Okay? <laughs> Not organic. And they come home and I eat all these Cocoa Puffs and all this cheap, unorganic vitamin D milk. And, of course, I'm going to feel really bad. And that, my goal that day was to, you know, hang off my roof and repair a window because it was a beautiful sunny day. And, um, but instead, I'm sick with Cocoa Puffs. I mean, my stomach hurts and I'm dizzy and I'm like, gosh, I don't think I'm really up for hanging on the, off the side of the building with the rope today because I feel like puking. So I don't. And wow, we have a huge lightning storm. comes out of nowhere. 15 minutes, all of a sudden it's there. The house gets struck by lightning. It's windy as hell. There's hail the size of dimes coming at me, but I'm not on the roof. Wow. See, my divine intelligence told me to do something that was bad, but it was good for me. You know, life is full of miracles when you follow your divine intelligence. And yeah, that's a funny story that's never going to happen. But I just want to emphasize that eating Cocoa Puffs is not a bad thing. <laughs> okay? Nothing is bad. Now, more realistically, what would happen if I was following my divine intelligence is I would, you know, go up to the top of my building, which happens to be 100 feet tall. Yes, it's a way up there. You don't want to be up there in a hail light and lightning storm. And I get my rope, and the minute I grab my rope, my divine intelligence would say, nah, don't do that. <laughs> That's the realistic story. But even if it's sad, go eat Cocoa Puffs. I need to go eat Cocoa Puffs, okay? Whatever it has to, however it has to get through my dumb ego, it has to get through it, right? So, when I say a good habit, when I say this planet is indicating a good habit in this course, I mean this planet is listening to your divine intelligence and helping you do what's right for you. And I say this planet is a bad habit in your chart. I don't mean it's going to make you smoke cigarettes. I mean it is telling, it's, it's listening to something that's not your divine intelligence. And so it gets you off track with your life. It derails you. It ruins your life. It makes you commit to things that ruin your life. It makes you say no to things that could make your life. Okay? And we don't want that. Our life is a result of our choices. And our choices are determined by these good and bad habits of are you following the divine intelligence within you or are you following anything else? Okay? Including that lame old astrologer called Ernst. Okay? All right. So let's say, when I say good or bad habits, um, I'm going to read this paragraph to make sure I don't miss anything. I mean, are you in the habit of following the divine intelligence within you that will guide you choice by choice to a healthier life experience? Or are you in the habit of following something else that sidetracks you, derails you, and makes it impossible to live a healthy life? That is what life comes down to. Are you in the habit of choosing what is right for you or not? There is an intelligence in you that knows what to do every moment, what to say yes to, what to say no to. Humans, however, as a species, have gotten into the habit of not listening to this inner intelligence, without which life cannot be lived successfully or happily. Okay? There's a book, it's called the Matsya Purana, if I, if I remember correctly, it's in that Purana. The Puranas are kind of like the book of myths and tales from India, okay? The Matsya Purana is named after the avatar Matsya, who stores all the wisdom of the world and of all men um, at the end of an age, okay? So, this story is about a guy who was trying to be a good guy. You know, he was trying to follow all the right things to do. You should wake up in the morning, do your sun ablu ablutions, meditate, you know, clean your teeth, clean your tongue, you know, pee in the right direction. You know, do all the right things that are in these Hindu books. I mean, seriously, you, it even tells you how to urinate in the morning some of these books. You know, there's a right way to do everything in India, okay? And 
He was trying to do all these right things, be the noble person, abstain from this, not steal this, da 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 da, you know? And he was miserable. And he looked around and he saw everyone was trying to be good and everyone was miserable. And then he saw a cow. Now this was a vegetarian society. This was not, you know, Texas, okay? And he saw the cow. And the cow was very happy. And he goes, wow, the cow looks so happy, so serene, so peaceful. You know, he doesn't poop in the, when he wakes up and at noon and after dinner. He poops when he wants to poop, you know? He has sex when he wants to have sex. He puts food, he eats when he wants to eat. Well, he lies down when he lies down down. And I don't see any rhythm or pattern or order to it. He just does it when he's prompted to do it by his inner self, by his inner energy. So he said, I'm going to do the same thing. From now on, I'm only going to follow that inner urges I have, that inner impulse of my energy. I'm not going to follow anything else. I'm just going to throw all my religious books away. Okay? And he did that. He met a girl, he wanted to have sex with her, he grabbed her, he had sex with her. He's hanging around with people, he wants to take a shit, he took shit right there. You know, he did that and he became enlightened. Okay? And this religion is called Go Dharma, the way of the cow. The way of just being what you are as prompted by your inner energy. Okay? I'm not saying we shouldn't use the toilet, okay? But I'm saying that this concept, this idea, that there's a part of ourself that knows what we need to do to be enlightened even, is present within us. And that we need to attune ourselves to that and get away from all the things that are telling us anything else. Okay? The goal of this course is to make you listen to your inner cow. You know, not to make you, but to teach you while you're not hearing that inner voice of wisdom, okay, of what's right to do. So you can do more of it and feel better, okay? All right. So the, in the context of the Lajitati Avashtas, the good Lajitati Avashtas are your good habits. The bad Lajitati Avashtas are your bad habits, which means the good ones are saying, hey, yes, I'm listening to my inner intelligence, the, the guidance within me that will never lead me astray are the good habits versus I'm listening to what my mom said, to what he said, to what she said, to what is supposed to be, to what the Bible said, to what I think I should be, to anything else. Because I'm a Capricorn human, okay? Not because of any of that. Life is supposed to be that simple. Our life is trying to work. It really is. There's life within you. It's trying to work so hard. It just wants to work. And if it works, it's done with this plane. You know? Sri Yudhishthira says, when God originally designed this world, we were supposed to come down here, experience a reality that worked for us, have a deep, meaningful experience that works, and leave with peace, and never need to come back. Yet here we are. It takes us a million lifetimes to do that. It's according to Yogananda. Because we come here, we get so disturbed, we don't live the life that works. We come back to try it again and again and again. A thousand, one to hundred year lifetimes of how long it takes to naturally get to a place where we're working. We're on a very long mission here. That's why we're going to use Lajitati of us, just to shortcut it as much as we can. Okay? So life starts at the sun. Everything starts with the sun in astrology. Okay? Life starts with the sun and it finishes with Saturn. And throughout our lives, throughout our days, we're in this constant motion of experiences from sun through Saturn, from sun through Saturn. And our life will work and then not work. It works when we're having the experiences of the planets on a good Lajitani Vashtas, and it stops working when we have to work or use a planet that has bad Lajitani Vashtas and therefore is in the bad habit of following something that's not us. Okay? But it's designed to work. If we would just leave it alone, it'll work. It'll take a million years, but it's going to work. Okay? Let's not leave it alone, though. Let's apply wisdom and intelligence of the Lajitati of Ashes to it, so it works faster. But we certainly need to leave it alone in the context of all the conditioning, all the 
BS we try to buy into, all the ways we try that aren't us, that make it take the million years. Okay? So it's not that we have to do more, we actually have to do less. It's not that we need to think more, we need to think a hell of a lot less. The amount of mental energy we spend, and mental energy takes a lot of energy, the amount of mental energy we waste in trying to figure things out that our divine intelligence is screaming at us to listen to is shocking. If you just stopped wasting that energy, you would get well with whatever is ailing you. It's that much of an energy deficit. And life is about energy. If you run an energy deficit, you get depressed, you get sick, you get miserable. Okay? And if you're trying to figure out everything with your pea brain, even with astrology and your pea brain, you're going to waste a tremendous amount of energy because there's something within you that's already capable of saying, hey, you already know. Everyone already knows, but are you listening? Your bad habits are keeping you from listening. So we're going to inform you about your bad habits. So when you feel that bad habit, you'll go, oh, I'm about to follow my bad habit again of not listening to what I just heard. And then you're going to listen to what you heard, and no one's going to be able to tell you what you're going to hear or what you should hear. Only you are going to hear it. It's all because it's all about you. It's about what's right for you. Okay? All right. Each of the seven planets is a step in the progress called life. Is that progress successful or somehow frustrating? Okay? Each planet has a responsibility to support life in progressing. It literally has a responsibility. Now you're on the Mars step. Now you're on the Mercury step. Are those planets going to carry you through or follow a bad habit? <clears throat> if the progress of life is frustrated, it becomes frustrated at the planet or planets are in the bad habit of choosing to not follow the inner intelligence. The planets are in, that are in the good habit of following the divine spark within us support our lives and flowing successfully. As we all have plants with both good and bad habits, life on Earth is a step forward and slide back experience for most of us, right? Or a mix of some things being on target and working, and other things going nowhere that is not anything but painful. The cure is to replace the bad habits with good. Okay? Start following your inner guidance system where you habitually hijacked it. It's actually possible. You're literally hijacking your inner guidance. Like your inner guidance is the captain that's saying, all right, that way. And you jump on his ass and beat him off and throw him overboard. That's what our bad habits really are doing. And so now you're sailing without a ship, a ship without a captain, and you get lost. You end up on the wrong island, you know, pick up the wrong passengers, all kinds of things. So here's the great thing. One of the fun things about being an astrologer you know, especially when we start predicting things for people, like predicting the events, and wow, we actually predict an event and it works. It's like a, wow, fate, it works, it's real. Is that people always ask, can I change my horoscope? The answer is no, you can't change your horoscope. Okay, why? Because your horoscope was created the day you were born. It's done, it's finished. Ka-chink. It's like you are stamped, ka-chink. You have this big stamp on you that is your horoscope. You can't change it. Okay? You don't have to change it. You can change your habits. That's all you can and have to change. All right? Who cares about changing your horoscope? Put another planet somewhere else. What difference is it going to make? Okay? It's still going to be a mess. It's still going to be full of bad habits. It's actually mathematically impossible to create a horoscope that's perfect. That's not got bad habits in it. Okay? So the great thing about the Lajitari Avastas is that there are five types of Avastas. There's the Shayanadi, the Lajitari, the Deep Tadi, the Jagradadi, and the Baladi Avastas. Okay? And each of these, each type provides our life based on the development of one of the five elements. So everything that happens in our life, everything we have is based on the these five Avastas. Every planet has these five Avastas. Every planet's rolling through our life saying, hey, I'm an infant. Hey, I'm awake. Hey, I'm sleeping. You know, and so on and so on. They're all coming through our lives in, in this way, a condition, an Avasta. 
And the only one of these, and they're all doing it in accordance with the five elements. It takes five elements to manifest something in this world. Everything in this world is a mix of the five elements, a different blend. Everything you have is a mix of these five avashtas, each of which relates to one of the elements. Okay? The great thing um, about the Lajitati avashtas is that the Lajitati avashtas have to do with the air element. The air element has a responsibility, as do all the elements, and that's, how, that's to displace things, change things, move things around. Get the idea? This is where change is possible, on the level of the air element. You can't really change things on the level of the other elements, okay? Because that's not what they're designed for. Change happens on the level of the air element, which is the Lajitadi Vashtas. That's why this class is Lajitadi Vashtas, master course, not Shayanadi Avashtas master course. Because you really can't change your Shayanadi Avashtas. Your Shayanadi Avashtas are like the ether. You know? It's the space. You're born on planet Earth. No, you don't have the option of going to a better planet which doesn't have Saturn and Rahu up there in the sky. Okay? You're on Earth. You're born with a certain level of capacity and intelligence and talents with certain family members. Um, in a country with certain liabilities and certain pluses, you know, there's this world you're born into. And in this world you're born into, this body that's this tall, has this much muscle capacity, this much aerobic capacity. And if you're born five foot tall, you're not going to be an NBA star playing basketball. It's just not going to happen. There's not, you, don't have, you don't fill the space to do that. You're not tall enough to do that. You can't change that. Okay? But your Lajitadi Vashtas, you can change, okay? And that means changing your habits. Habits are the only thing we can change. They really are the product of our habits. If your life's not working, it's because the habit is to do more that's not following your divine guiding system. If your life is working, you're in the habit of doing more of following your divine guidance system, okay? Now, it sounds so simple, and you might be thinking, yeah, but the way I feel, it's way above and beyond me following my divine guidance system. I get you, why you would say that. You say that because you don't understand all the shit that goes wrong inside yourself and then outside of yourself when you don't follow your guidance system. You get depressed, you get anxiety, you get fear, you get sick, you get crippled, you get accidents. You know, you get in altercations that you never hoped or planned for. You get all the bad shit that's happening in your life, okay? It's shocking what happens when we don't live in accordance with what our life is really about, what we're really here to experience, and, in, and to experience in the, right way, the way that's right for us. I think all of us have an idea of what we want and need to experience, but that doesn't matter. If you go about trying to experience it in a way that doesn't work, in a place that doesn't work, with the people it doesn't work, you're not going to get that experience. Okay? So, not following our inner guidance system, the ramifications are huge. The ramifications are everything that hurts you. Okay? So, we can actually change the Lajitani Vashtas, our habits. We really can't change much of anything else. So the ether element, like I said, it's the space we're grown and born into, including our body. We can't change that. The other elements that, you know, the fire element, the other elements have to, sorry, the other vashtas have to do with the fire, water, and, air, and earth elements. You know, the diptadiya vashtas, the jagradadiya vashtas, and the baladiya vashtas. We can't change those either. But we don't need to. Because if we change the tadiya vashta, they give something. Even if they're bad, even if they're all weak, they're all quantitative avashtas. Okay? It just shows how much you're going to get of something at the end of the day, especially the Jagradadi and Baladi avashtas. Okay? You don't need to think about those. I shouldn't have used those words in this course, but I just had to fill you in that there's actually five. But the one that matters is the Lajitadi avashtas. If you follow a, start changing a habit that allows you to have something you, that's right for you, you have something right for you. It doesn't matter how much of that something is there, or how famous you are for that something is there in accordance with the other vashtas. It don't matter. 
All that matters is, do you have something right in your life or do you have what's wrong in your life? That determines your happiness, well-being and state of health in this world, both mental, emotionally and physically. Okay. So we only have to look at the Lajitani Vashas. We can just scrape everything else. Okay. So the other Vashas don't really create limitations. Even the ether element, which creates a limitation of you know, the, where you're born, on earth, what country, what body you have, etc. That's not a limitation. Those are the exact right things for you to live the right life that's right for you. But it might not feel that way. Why? Because your Lajitani Vashtas have too many bad habits attached to them. Too many plants with bad habits that are trying to do things, think they have to do things, that the internal guidance system is not behind. The world you're in, the place you're in, is exactly the right place once you start listening to your internal guidance system. So if you were born uh, impoverished, if you were born without parents, if you were born in any tragic situations, that's the situation your life is going to build best from, believe it or not. Okay? Ether, after all, is all about faith. You know, watch what people do, what happens to people when they try to change their space, but they haven't changed behaviorally, they haven't changed their habitual way of being, their habitual way of making choices. So they change this and they change that, they go to a new job, they go to a new country, they're still not happy, okay? We only become more happier when we change our habits, when we work our lachitani vashtas, okay? It's a waste of energy to try to change anything else, okay? Only the air elements about change, only the Lajitari Vashtas will allow us to change our lives, okay? Let's see here, make sure I don't skip anything. So, you can change your Lajitari Vashtas under the influence of good habits. All the other Vashtas, no matter what they are, are going to be working for you. You'll get something you need and something you want. But under the habits of bad Lajitani Vashtas, even the best of the other Vashtas is going to drop you flat on your face and you're not going to get what you need. Okay? The Lajitani Vashtas are all about it. It's interesting, in Hindu myth, myth we, we learn of just how important the air element is, like in um, the Ramayana. So it's all about Lord Rama, right? But there's this, this, this monkey guy around called Hanuman, who sort of is making, is the most important character when it comes to actually getting stuff done. I mean, without Hanuman, nothing would have happened. Hanuman is the son of the wind. He represents the air element, okay? The air element is so very important um, in our lives. It's what allows change to happen. And we're all here to change. So the Lajitani Vashtas is what it's all about. And it always comes down to it. The only thing we can change in our lives that will make a significant difference is those things indicated by our Lajitani Vashtas. Are you going to continue following your bad habits and hijack your life? Or are you going to start following your inner guidance which already knows what is correct for you? Okay. In respect to following your internal guidance system, there is nothing to learn about it. There's nothing to learn. It's about following blindly. You know how humans have this desire to follow blindly? You know, we're just such idiots. We're looking for some person, some guru, some book, and we just want to follow it blindly. I remember when I got Brihat Prashar or Shastra, I was like, I'm going to follow this book. Yeah, this is it. It didn't work. I had to really start thinking to make anything in that book. There was no blind... Faith wasn't going to work, okay? But we want to follow blindly. We really, really do. We crave it. Because we're supposed to follow our own internal guidance system blindly. Which means your energy is saying, do this. And you're like, what? That's going to ruin my life. And it's like, come along. This is what we got to do next. And you got to follow it that blindly sometimes. It won't make sense to your mind. 
Okay? So, you have to follow blindly. Don't, it's not following some religion or teacher or any external authority blindly, but following your inner guidance system with full blind faith that proves correct every time. Okay? Think how many times you decided to do something after so much thought put, was put into it, after so many checking of horoscopes, and how it really probably didn't work out that well after all that work and all that thought. Okay? Think about all the times you did something that you knew you should not have done. You knew you shouldn't do it, but something in you made you do it anyway. You know, some idea, some need, some pressure, some inhibition, something stupid made you not, made you do something that you knew was going to bite you. Okay? Wouldn't life have been better if you had listened to what your insides knew? All it takes is clearing out your bad habits. So we want to follow these blindly, like that guy who, you know, founded the Go Dharma, the way of the cow where he just followed his urges, his natural urges, not his sick, perverted, crazy urges, but his true urges that were coming from the divine spark within him. Okay? And yes, blindly, because our minds are not going to make sense of it. I mean, our minds are too programmed to accept the reality of what we are, and what we need to do, and what's right for us. It's just too programmed. Which brings me to the next topic. How and why do we form bad habits that ruin our life? Okay? Imagine life as an ocean that is often referred to as God. All is water. The ocean has countless waves, countless manifestations of different shapes, speed, size, force, temperature, etc. Each of these waves is an individual manifestation of life. You and I. You're one wave, you're on that wave, someone else is that wave, right? All on the same ocean. Okay? On the surface, we appear as separate waves, but the reality is that we are all just manifestations of one body of water, the ocean of God. The ocean is moving the wave. The wave is not moving the ocean. Okay? The ocean moving the wave is the inner guidance system. All right? Listening to the inner guidance system is allowing the ocean to move us. It's God will. And then I write, in India this is called Go Dharma, the way of the cow, which I've already explained. Okay? It is not, however, an ocean of water. It's an ocean of energy. Tremendous energy that is pervading all things, giving and taking life, and most importantly, energizing us. This energy is intelligent, it's divine, it's alive, it's life, it's God. This intelligence is energizing each of us, all of us, every one of us. Are we in the habit of following that energy, or in the habit of following something else? Those are our two options. Which are, which are we doing? The good habit or the bad habit of following anything else? This is what determines our well-being on a mental, energetic, emotional, and physical level. Why don't we follow the guidance given to us by this ocean of intelligent, divine energy? Habits. But what forms the habits? You know? Well, we were in the habit before we died in our last lifetime, then we showed up here, and something reinforced that bad habit. And that's what I'm going to talk about next. Three things. Stress, examples, and conditioning or programming. As to stress, we get a stress in life. We're meant to respond to it. Let it go and then be ready for the next stress. But what if there is a constant type of stress? Then we get into the habit of responding to that stress to the point that we respond to that way in all situations, most of which do not merit the habitual response. So let's say I have a son, and every day I, um, you know, I bite him on the ear. I just take a chunk out of his ear, or his neck. I just come up and go, Hi! You've been a bad boy, you little bastard. And I do that every day, right? Now he's 15 years old, he's gone through puberty, and he wants to be in love. The prettiest girl she shows up. She goes to give him a hug, give him a kiss on the neck, and he runs. <laughs> you know, you see, that's what happens. We have a stress, and then we, we continue to follow that stress, the results of that stress, even when the last thing we want to is to do that. More than anything else, that kid really, really needs a kiss from that pretty girl. Okay? But he's in the habit of being scared 
and cringing the moment somebody's face comes up to his neck, right? Okay. Now let's say on another end, I kiss my son, I kiss my daughter on the cheek or the neck or the ear every day. Good morning, good morning, good morning, right? Then they're 21 years old and they're walking down the street on a dark night, you know, in Seattle, of course, and a vampire shows up. And the vampire goes to, with their head towards their neck and they say, oh, yes, wrong decision. You see? Habits. No matter, they're never good. Just following blindly is never good. But stress, both, you know, and positive reinforcement trains us to act like zombies, to respond a certain way every time it happens. That's human behavior. That's egocentric behavior. But your divine intelligence knows. It knows that this is a bite. This is a kiss. Even if it's been bit a hundred times, when the kiss comes, it knows. And it says, stay there. But you don't. You run. Okay? You know, you get hurt in love a hundred times. And you know you're going to get hurt. So when you feel love, you run. But your inner guidance system is saying, hey, this time don't run. But you're like, uh-uh, I'm going to run. Okay? So, this, these stresses, habitual happenings, cause us to lose, the, you know, cause us to not listen to our inner guidance system. We have to stay in that system. And it takes a lot of work and healing to work through trauma that keeps us from listening to it. It takes will, it takes strength. And as we talk about the different specific of us, just, we'll talk about the different types of trauma you might have experienced that you're responding to instead of responding to your inner intelligence. So, stress that creates trauma that causes you to react out of trauma instead of reacting out of your inner intelligence. It's one of the main reasons your life's not working. Okay? All right. Okay, the example I like to use is a sol that of a soldier during World War II, holding watch on a cold night. So he's cold, he's freezing, he's scared, he's nervous, he doesn't want to fall asleep, right? So what does he do? He lights up a cigarette. He's puffing on a cigarette. All right, the warm smoke, all right, he feels better. The nicotine makes him less nervous and anxious, right? And less seeing things that aren't there. So he's more alert for the watch. Smoking gives him something to do so he doesn't fall asleep. Now his chances of survival have increased. So it was a good thing for him to smoke that cigarette. Okay? It was necessary. It might have saved his life and the life of many people that were depending on him to keep proper watch. The only problem is, 10 years later, he's sunbathing on a hot beach with his children, chain smoking, right? That's what happens, okay? We do things that we need to to survive, to be okay, to get through a moment, over and over again, and then we get stuck repeating that action over and over again, even when it's no longer appropriate to do that. And when we're born, we're, we have these parents, and these parents have constant issues. Our mom has constant issues, our dad has constant issues, our parents together have constant issues. There's something wrong with them. But what? They're bad lachitati vashtas. Okay? So, they're not going to do a good job raising us, just like we're not going to do a good job raising our kids. Because we have too many bad lachitati vashtas, and we're habitually hurting ourselves, hurting our children, and the child is responding. The child's trying to get through that moment of living with bad laji tati of the parents, okay? And it has to respond in a way that's not true to itself, just to survive in that family. And then we all end up developing habits, ways of being, behaviors that are not true to who we really are. And that's when the process of disease starts. Okay, I'll talk more, a lot more about that as we go. Okay? The same thing happened to each of us. We responded in a way that was necessary and got stuck responding that way. And so instead of acting appropriately in all situations, the way that our inner guidance system is capable of showing us, we react in a predictable hit and miss way. And so we have a hit and miss life with the hits often having the greater impact. Everyone's heard something called living in the moment, okay? Did you ever really think of what that means? 
of course, duh, I can only live in the moment, right? I only can do what I'm doing right now. So right now, I can pull my ponytail. I didn't pull my ponytail three minutes ago, so I cannot pull my ponytail three minutes ago, right? I can say I'm going to pull my ponytail in three minutes, but I don't know. My wife might sneak up behind me and cut my ponytail off in two minutes, and therefore I will not be able to do that. I have no way of knowing what I can do in three minutes. That's not living in the moment. Truly living in the moment means that what you're doing that moment has nothing to do with all the shit that happened to you the last however many years you've been on earth. It has nothing to do with all your trauma. But we don't do that. We don't live in the moment because we're living the moment with our trauma that happened so long ago. Okay? We need to release and become free and heal all that garbage before we can live in the moment fully. And we can't heal that shit until we have experiences that heal it. Aren't we all running around for the experience that will heal us, right? We meditate, we go to the counselor, we do this and we do that, and we run around in circles on this hamster wheel called Earth, trying to find what's going to help us heal from that trauma. And we rarely find it. Why? Because we're not listening to our internal guidance system. Our internal guidance system says, yay, dude, this is what you need to heal from that trauma, go. And the rest of you is going, uh-uh, I ain't going to do that. You hijack that too. Where are you going to go to heal? Your internal guidance system knows that. You were born broken. You were born with an internal guidance system that was saying, hey, to heal, this is how you have to be. And you said, shut up. I'm going to do it my way. And you didn't heal. Okay? So this is a huge, huge thing. Even the healing you need is going to be most readily discoverable as you start learning about your internal guidance system. You don't have to do the work as much as you have to have the right experience. How do you get the right experience? We're here to have experiences, to feel things in our body and our heart, our emotions, and to grasp things with our mind and consciousness. We're to have these experiences that impact us on many, many levels with pain and pleasure. And those are the experiences that are changing us. And our inner guidance system knows what experience we need. You know, you might need the experience of something horrible and your inner guidance will lead you there. And you'll get through that horror and go, wow, I'm not scared anymore. That's one of the best ways to heal. If someone's scared of being alone, just imagine if they were on an island alone for a year and survived. How good that would feel to them. Wow, I was on an island alone and not only did I survive, I had a lot of fun figuring out 101 different ways to eat coconuts. Okay? So, only our inner guidance system can know what experiences we need to heal that trauma. All right? So it's a sort of a, you know, catch-22. We can't listen to our inner guidance system because of our trauma. We can't live in the moment where our inner guidance system is communicating with us. And we can't heal without the right experiences. So what do we do? We use our minds. Our minds do have certain uses. We try to grasp the situation. We understand our Lajitadi Vashtas. And we say, okay, the next time I'm feeling that Lajitadi Vashta coming on top of me and making me shut up or making me angry or making me scared or making me this or that, whatever it is, as you learn what that Vashta is doing to you, you say, I'm going to tell that Vashta to shove it. I'm not going to listen to it. I'm going to do anything contrary I can to that. I'm going to do something else. And the something else will be your guidance system. Just a little bit. And then you start going in the right direction. And eventually you'll take bigger steps as you become more clear. Okay? And the process begins and will become finalized. All right. So examples are the second reason we do not follow our inner guidance system. Okay, in the ocean, each wave is different, right? Every wave is different, right? Yes, many waves travel in groups. You have this group of waves that are all doing the similar thing, right? And then there's that first wave over there doing some weird thing all by himself, okay? But each wave is a bit different each time in its own way, right? Every wave is a little different. That is life. That's each of us. But we look at the other waves and we say, 
I want to be just like that wave. That's the wave to be, spelled W-A-Y-V-E. That's the wave to be, right? We're always saying, that's the way to be, right? That's the wave to be. Or I don't want to be like that wave. That is not the wave to be, okay? And we develop these ideas about the examples we see due to the stress with which we see them, okay? If we have an abusive father, for example, there is an example of violence in a very stressful situation. And the result is that a person will likely become violent or pacifist. Okay? Neither is correct or healthier than the other. If you become violent as a result of a violent father, that's not healthy. If you become a pacifist as a result of a violent father, that's not healthy either. Okay? If we have an older sibling who gets great grades and our parents praise them and we feel the stress of being left out, we decide we want to get great grades too or we decide that grades don't matter. Again, neither is more healthy or more correct. When is being violent correct and healthy? When violence saves somebody. When is violent incorrect? When is it bullying? When it takes advantage of others? Okay? When is getting grades worth focusing on? When getting grades gets you to a place in your life you want to be. When is grades a, a waste of your time? When those grades get you nothing that's important to you. <laughs> okay? It's really just that simple. But that's not how we act in our lives. We experience things with a stress attached and then we decide this is the wave to be or the wave not to be. All right? And now we're living our lives out of the stress, these examples that had an impact on us because the stress that that example was delivered with. And now we're lost. The most powerful examples and conditioning influences, uh, let me check. Okay, so those examples. Conditioning is the third reason we do not follow our inner guidance system, and every example we see is also a conditioning force. Everything you see, everything that happens around you, is a conditioning force. Okay? So are the stories that surround us from the myths to the media. If this condition so if, if these conditioning influences, by some huge chance, okay, matches the true you, wow, are you lucky? Wow, what if the world that conditions you is exactly matches who you really are? Wouldn't that be nice? Okay? And the truth of it is, it does that for some people more than others. But for most of us, and all of us who ever wanted to learn astrology, it does not, and so it becomes so difficult to listen to our inner intelligence which actually knows who we are, what we need, and what we're ready to do. The most powerful examples and conditioning influences are that of our parents. All right? The father's the tenth house, the mother's the fourth house, your parents as a unit are the ninth house. Okay? Now the thing is, your parents are, are really mostly relating to you as the ninth house. Why? Because your dad's treating you the way he is, your mom's treating you the way sh she is, because she's with your dad and he's with her. Okay? They're not, if they didn't have your dad around, they'd be treating you differently. If mom, if dad didn't have your mom around, he would treat you differently. Okay? They're treating you the way they're treating each other because of how they're working together. Okay? And that's the strongest conditioning influence in our lives, is that of our parents being together, having an influence in our life. All right, let's say your dad left your mom when, you know, when she was pregnant with you. All right, she's still treating you based on the fact that your dad left her with you, okay? So, we never really get the full experience of what our mother or father is really like. We're always getting the experience of what our mother or father is like based on the fact that they married somebody who was our father or mother, okay? And so this... Parental conditioning is huge. So your parents are with each other for a mix of reasons. Some of the reasons are right reasons for them. Other reasons are wrong reasons. Because when they decided to get married, they got married based on a mix of their good and bad habits, their good and bad lachitani avashtas. All right? So some parts of the relationship work, other parts don't. So when they approach you and they're raising you and being the example in your life, they're dealing with the joy and the stress of some things being right and some things being wrong. Okay? So the ninth house is the, pr 
primary conditioning influence in our lives, that of our parents. The ninth house is also our culture, okay? So even though the father's the tenth and the mother's the fourth, those houses are not nearly as important, okay? The ninth house is the house of God according to some astrologers. We can't really fit God into a house in the horoscope, all right? He has all the houses and beyond, but let's get into the drift of the idea. The ninth is of critical importance. From the point of view of a primitive culture, the sun, the moon, the wind, the fire are gods, as these things determine their chances of survival. If the snow comes early, there's going to be a lot of hungry people in that primitive tribe, right? Because they didn't have enough time to get it, gather enough meat and dry enough fruit, okay? If a frost comes in April, it destroys, kills all the apple blossoms on the apple trees, what's the tribe going to do, right? So these forces of nature determine their chances of survival. So what did they do? They start worshiping them. They even make sacrifices to the sun in order to have, you know, a good life on earth, in order to survive. From the point of view of an infant, the parents are the gods as they are what determines the infant's chances of survival. Just as the primitives will do anything to appease the sun, etc., even making sacrifices to them, an infant and young child will do anything to appease the parents and thus begins to lose himself behind habitual behaviors to appease the parents. Yes, you're in this game where you've got parents with bad habits, parents who some things are working in their life and some things are not working in their lives, trying to raise you. There's no way it's going to be done in accordance with what your real needs are. You need to survive. You have to try to harmonize as much as you can. And the minute you pop out of the womb, you try to start appeasing your parents somehow. And people do this in all kinds of ways. Some kids are two years old trying to figure out how to help their mom and dad have less fights. Wow. That's not even the kid's business, you know, but we have to. We have to appease the gods. Those who are responsible for our survival, we want everything to be as good as possible to increase our chances of survival. And not only survival as far as getting food in our mouth, but survival for humans means to be feeling okay. It means I'm surviving and I'm okay. And so we immediately start to respond and react to all these stresses in ways that aren't necessarily us. And then we grow up in the habit of responding to certain ways in certain ways that are not really us. And then our life gets off track. And we start doing things, not because it's the right thing to do, but because we're in the habit of relating to one of our parents in a certain way. Okay? In Vedic astrology, there's something called the Vimshopakbala, and it lets us see how strong certain planets are. And depending on what Varga and House you're examining, you use a different calculation. All right? So if you're looking at the Saptamsha, which has to do with your marriage life and your children, okay, you calculate the points differently than, say, you're looking at your Navamsha okay? or your Rashi chart. And when it comes to how you calculate it in your, um, for the Saptamsha, the Vargas that give the most points are your Rashish Varga, your, which is you and your relationship to yourself, and your Dwadasamsha, which is your relationship with your parents. So your relationship with your parents impacts your relationship, your marital well-being, how you raise your kids more than your kids or your spouse does. Okay? What makes a relationship work? It's when the relationship you had with your parents and the relationship they had with their parents twisted you guys into a shape that allows you guys to fit together or not. It's whether your ancestral karma is your experiences with your parents, which is based on their experience with their parents going back and back, creates a twisted being that fits you or not. Okay? Are you t that's more important than the actual person you're with. Okay? The parental influence is huge. All right. And so the kid is uh, trying to live in this environment, developing these habits, 
We relate to our parents in a way as an infant that's not truly us, and we carry that over into our relationships. And that's why they say, you know, you marry your mother, you marry your father, etc., etc. You're still trying to resolve and appease one of the gods of your parents, or perhaps both of them, with your spouse. And it's not going to work. Okay? But it's such a powerful conditioning influence, it's really the number one reason why we don't listen to our um, inner guidance system. Because we're still trying to survive an adolescent experience instead of living in the moment. Okay? So, if you look at the ninth house and the ninth lord, if those houses, if that house has got some bad avashta planets in it, or the ninth lord is in bad avashta, bad lajitati avashtas, you know that the conditioning influence of this person was totally different than who they really are. Which means they grew up in a family where the influences of the parents were so different from what the kid really was. On the other hand, if the ninth house and ninth lords are in good Lajitani Vashtas, it means that the conditioning influences that person experience, actually quite a bit of that fit who they really are. Okay? So they, they believe in their parents, they follow their parents, they follow their culture that their parents follow. Okay? They have peace in that. Their path is clear. But when those ninth house and ninth lords are, raw, are in bad shape, so you've got a bad planet in the ninth, a bad avashta planet in the ninth, or the ninth lord in a bad lajitani avashta, and the house is worse than the lord, it makes a bigger impact than the lord, then the conditioning influences were so far removed from who that child really was that the child has this huge process of self-discovery to make. They are lost and they need to be found. Nothing they were, nothing they, no conditioning they received was this is actually you, or very little, the, it, very little amount. Most of it was against their grain of who they really are. And so they now have to spend a lifetime finding the, what's right for them. Okay. So you'll see people who are heavily struggling with conditioning influences, and you'll see other people who are happy and jolly because the conditioning influences they received actually lined up with who they are. Okay? All right. <clears throat> All right, last thing, and then we get to quit this first class. There's nothing in this world that is good or bad other than habits. Okay? Think about that. There's nothing in this world that's good or bad other than habits. All right? Yeah, I know there's the Ten Commandments, the Yamas and Niyamas, etc. And they say don't kill. But they don't say killing is bad. <laughs> there's a big difference. Krishna and Lord Rama killed a lot of beings. We are supposed to emulate Krishna and Rama. So who do I have to kill? You know, who do I have to kill to be enlightened based on Lord Rama and Krishna and everything they did? Not only, not to mention all the fun Krishna had with all those gopi girls, right? So, you know, we get all these precepts. This is the right thing to do. This is a bad thing to do. I'm saying no. There is no good or bad things to do. There's only good or bad habits. Okay? Killing when necessary is good. Killing as a habit is bad. Okay? This is an extreme example of life. Practically speaking, most of us do not have to be much concerned as to whether our inner guidance system is saying to kill or not to kill. But we do have to be concerned about things that have just as much impact to the happiness in our life. For example, being bossy is bad, right? Everyone knows that, right? Yes, in some situations it is. In other situations, it's what's needed. Sadly, many people fall into the category of, I'm the boss yesterday, today, and tomorrow, or don't look at me, I'm not the boss. Okay? Imagine how much better life would be if people decided who is the boss, moment by moment, situation by situation, in accordance with the knowingness of the inner guidance system. Which means, yeah, it's best if you're boss now. And, oh, in this situation, it's best if I'm the boss. Wouldn't that be nice? But that's not how we work as humans. It's how we're supposed to work. Okay? But we get in the habit of being the boss, or we get in the habit of being the follower, right? And then imagine how much better life would be if people decided all things based on the knowingness of the inner guidance system. 
instead of out of a good or bad habit. That would be, or out of a bad habit, sorry, that would be harmony because the inner guidance system of one person is the same as that of the other. Remember? It's that ocean of energy. It's what's energizing and telling us all to do what it's telling us to do. And if we're, everyone's listening to their inner guidance system, everyone's going to agree that, yeah, this is what we need to do. Yeah, my inner guidance says you're the boss. My inner guidance says you're the boss. My inner guidance says you're the boss. And the bo that guy's inner guidance saying, yeah, I think I need to be the boss today. But that's not what happens. This guy goes, oh, I gotta be the boss, or else I'm nothing. You know? And this person's over here is like, I don't care who's the boss, I just know I can't do it. And this person's over here is like, I really should be the boss, but I'm just scared to speak up, so I'm just gonna get frustrated and storm out of the room. That's how humans work. That's disharmony. Okay? Two people both following their inner guidance system may harmoniously decide that it's correct to discern something by a fight to the death. Yeah. I think my inner guidance system says we need to fight to the death over this. And yours agrees. Okay, let's do it. It's harmonious. It's beautiful. I know that sounds shocking, right? That is why in even the highest age, the Satya Yuga, during which people are in touch with the indwelling divine intelligence, they still fight. They still war. They still kill each other. There's no Yuga where there's no war. People want peace on earth. When they say that, they see people not killing each other? No, it's never going to happen. The show must go on. The movie must continue. The karmas must be balanced. The experiences must be experienced. But are they experienced harmoniously in accordance with the needs and the correctness of the divine intelligence? Or are they happening because of programmed egos who can't even be, have any, have, don't even have enough peace with themselves even know what they should have for breakfast in order to be healthy that day. Okay, that's disharmony. Harmony is an experience of being, it's not what we do. Okay? You can't go anywhere in this world without killing something. Get in your car and drive somewhere and show me that you didn't pick up a bug on your windshield. Right? Go on a walk and show me that an ant, you, that you didn't step on a single ant or that you didn't crush a single seed that was just about to shoot through the soil and you just came around the time that, that gave that seed no chance, right? You know, harmony is living in accordance with what's right for you because that's what's right for everyone, even if it hurts sometimes, okay? Harmony does not mean freedom from pain. See, we're supposed, pain is just part of life. We experience pain, we heal from pain, we learn from pain, and we move on as better people from pain. That's the purpose of pain. Unfortunately, we've traded in pain for trauma. Trauma is not part of life. It's not supposed to be part of life. Trauma particularly happens when Saturn's in bad lunch, he taught you this. Because Saturn's the plan that says, all right, I can let go of this now. I don't have to be traumatized by this. I don't have to hold on to this. If Saturn's in bad shape, wow, you're dealing with more trauma, okay? which means more healing is necessary. All right, there's nothing good or bad. There's just living in the moment, making choices, doing things because you're following your good intelligence, or there's doing the next wrong thing because of some, something else for any other reason, because you think you should, because your mama will love you if you do, because you won't get spanked if you don't, because you know, people won't hate you if you do. None of those are valid reasons to do anything. But those are the reasons we choose instead of, wow, this is the right thing for me to do. That will give me health and happiness in the long term. Okay? All right, so the next thing we're going to talk about in the next video, now you've kind of got the gist of where we're going with this, is the planets. I'm going to talk about how each of the planets has a responsibility, is a stepping stone for getting you through your day, through your life, okay? And, you know, you need to understand what the plants are doing so you can understand when they're in a bad Lachitania Vashto or a good, how the plant is helping you listen to your inner voice, your inner knowing, or not, you know? I remember once when I was at an Aqua conference, I met a really great guy, his name was Prince Harindra Singh. And this was a guy who, he was born a prince of some, you know, place in India. And he um, decided to go live in the Himalayas. And he went and lived in the Himalayas for 12 years. He meditated with masters in the Himalayas. 
He learned, he learned astrology and he would come and teach astrology. Or I don't even want to use that word, he'll slap me if I use that word. He would lecture on inspiration. And he said, don't ever teach people anything, inspire people was his modem. And, or his mode. And he said that it's important to always follow your first voice. Meaning that first voice that's in you, that knows. He said, always follow your first voice in everything. You know? He goes, you're going to confuse your first voice with your second voice. And mostly you're going to follow your second voice and get into trouble. But he said, always follow your first voice. That's what you have to do. He gave this whole lecture on astrology that basically said, follow your first voice, follow your first voice, follow your first voice. And that's basically what this whole course is going to be. It is about following your first voice, your first inner voice. And we're going to expand on that to the point that you're going to understand why you're not following your first voice, where you're getting stuck, the associated trauma that might be causing you to not listen to your first voice, so that you can heal from that and start listening to your first voice and living a life that, like I said, you wake up, feeling good to wake up and you go to bed feeling good that you're going to bed. That's what we want. We want a life that we wake up with with hope or excitement or passion and we want to go to bed feeling okay, if today worked. I feel good about how today worked. I feel good about how people treated me today. I feel good about how I what I got done today. Even if all you got done was clean your dishes. Okay? Alright. Let's do it.